to uh, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3, we are um, going to be looking at kind of a major section of this chapter, verses 5 through 17, and I've given it a title. I don't always title messages, but this one seemed pretty obvious to me. It's what to wear. Is that what it says in your bulletin, what to wear? Uh Wearing clothes <laughs> is a good thing, uh, uh, but you know, wearing clothes, it, there's choice involved in wearing clothes, right? Wouldn't you say? I mean, hopefully, hopefully you have some choice, um, and every day you have a choice of what to wear. You've got old clothes, you've got new clothes, maybe, some newer things. Uh, you've got things that don't fit. If you're like me, you hang on to those things if you like them, whether they fit or not. Because you're thinking, well, maybe one day I'll slim down to my, you know, <laughs> my marriage weight of 135 or whatever, you know. <laughs> yeah, you got clothes for different seasons, right? You guys are, you're starting to wear shorts again and your white legs are showing, whatever. <laughs> We've got clothes for different seasons, some fit well, again, some don't. Some seem appropriate at different times, some not so much. Things wear out. Sometimes you get rid of them. But as Christians, we're like clean people. But sometimes we're like clean people wearing old clothes or dirty clothes or stinky clothes. We've been remodeling our kitchen, and I told Lori, Yesterday, it's like, man, I feel like I'm like, like I've taken like six showers in two days, because you know, it's like you get all grimy and dirty, and then you you get done with your project, and it's like, I just can't wait to get out of my dirty, stinky clothes, and I'm sure I stink. When I get out of the shower, though, I don't put the clothes back on. I mean, if you do, you know, God bless you. <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's a whole other issue, right? But you put on clean clothes. You put on something fresh, something that smells good and looks good, hopefully. The problem comes, though, when we find ourselves, though we're clean on the inside, we're kind of wearing old, grubby, dirty clothes. This is the problem that Paul is addressing in the church in Colossae, they are new creations, right? They're, they're Christians, they're brand new, they're changed, and then they're going back and embracing old ideas of religion. And they're like old clothes. They're like, not even old clothes, they're clothes that don't fit anymore. They're clothes that don't make sense anymore. And he's presenting in this discussion, he presents this, Clothing thing is kind of an analogy. Put on the right clothes. Make sure you're wearing the right clothes. And I would say it's a choice. It is a choice that we have every day. How are we going to clothe ourselves? So let's look, uh, picking up at verse 5. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, he says, Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them, but now you also put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, <coughs> slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who's being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all and in all. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. 
Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you, beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Well, you can see in, in this whole discussion, you can see the, the putting off and the putting on. That's the, the image that he's given us repeatedly throughout this text. There's, there's certain things you can, you can take off, that you ought to take off, that you ought to put away, be done with, and there's other things that you want to put on. And so he, he gives us this beautiful analogy. He starts off with uh, what I would just call, maybe you might refer to as the big five. He lists some sins there. These are the really smelly sins, the really stinky. They all stink. And, and, and even though he seems to separate them, there's no sense that there's a separation in their sinfulness. They're all sin. They're all wrong. But he lumps them in two different categories. And the first ones what I'm calling the big five, immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed. Immorality is one that is easy for us to understand. It's the Greek word pornea. Pornea. It's exactly what it sounds like. This is anything of a sexual nature that doesn't go on in the marriage bed. So any sexual activity outside of the marriage bed, Christian or not, that's pornea, that's immorality. Whether it's images or thoughts or activity, it's all lumped into the same category. It's immorality. It's wrong, by the way. Can I get an amen? If there's one thing that's corrupting our world, maybe more than anything else, it's this. Pornea is destroying an entire generation, especially of young men. I think this is where a lot of the confusion comes from because kids earlier and earlier and earlier are getting exposed to immoral thoughts, immoral images, and it's destroying people it's destructive now he he lists just impurity this is again this is a, a sexual impurity this is just a general moral impurity it's, it's rampant passion this isn't good passion right there's good passion you should be passionate for the lord you should be passionate for your husband or passionate for your wife even passionate for your kids in the proper sense this is uncontrolled passion. You were made with passion, right? You, you have passion for something. The problem is you're not supposed to follow that passion necessarily. People say, oh, this is the way I was made. So what? Right? It's sinful. It needs to be identified for what it is. If you have passion for your neighbor's wife, that's wrong. You don't follow that passion, right? Because, because you're thinking and rational, but you're not a dog, right? A, a dog doesn't, they just follow their passion. But we're humans. And beyond that, we're Christians. We have to control these things. We have to learn to put these things off. Passion, the uncontrolled and improper drive that we have. We have evil desires, these, I think, King James is wicked cravings. Again, a lot of them, they're, they seem like they could all be kind of mixed up in, you know, almost like one thing, but there's a distinction in each one of them. We have desire for all kinds of things. We could make a list of different things that we desire. 
This is a desire, an evil craving for something that the Lord has not provided, nor does he want you to have. Doesn't stop us, it seems. Greed. Idolatry. He says, he says this greed, this is something that you need to put off. This thing, it's, it's idolatry. It's something you want what you can't have. And, and, and again, it's, it's all wrapped up together in a sense. You, you desire it. You're passionate for it even. This, however, is it's for the thing that God has said no to. And it's insatiable. You'll never have enough of whatever it is you're greedy for. I mean, that's just kind of the very nature of it. You're, you, it'll, there's never anything that'll satisfy that once you go down that road. The essence of idolatry is the desire to get. It's based in greed. You guys have seen the, the little Buddhist shrines at the Asian restaurants? You know what I'm talking about? You go to an Asian restaurant. I know our favorite pho place. You know, they've got the little th shrine there up by the cash register, and they put some oranges and different things out there. That's not worship. They're not, they're not worshiping God. They're doing this, and they do this because they expect their business to prosper. It's based in greed. It's idol worship. It's not like, oh, 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 you're a sovereign God whom I love and have devoted my life to. No, it's here's an offering. Here I've arranged this thing so that you'll bless me. It's based in greed. And that's why Paul says, listen, this greed, it's, it's idolatry. It's idol worship. Now, if you just take these five and you just consider them for any length of time at all, which I've been doing all week, it's hard not to see how in our culture all of these are celebrated like crazy. Like just as a people, we celebrate all of these things. Don't we? I mean, just, just, just think about, you know, what's out there in the entertainment world. M movies and television shows and stuff. But immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, greed. <clears throat> Even sports have been driven so much by greed, so much for, by money. It's evident, I think, just looking at these, this, this is, it encapsulates humanity in our fallen nature. We go after these things, it, and actually they kind of take over and have taken over our society. Now, you guys know the, the big news story this month or, you know, in the last few weeks has been uh, just the overturning of these abortion laws in different states. It's, it's interesting to watch. I'm, on, on one hand, I'm, I'm a little torn because I'm excited that, that finally, uh, at least in some of these states, we're acknowledging the fact that this is murder. But I don't know that hearts are changed, right? There's a, there's a political movement, but it's not necessarily because hearts and minds are changed. There's not really wholesale repentance. It's just our team's in charge in this state, and so we can get the law changed. And so I'm a little, it's like, a, I'm happy, but then it's like, ah, I don't really want a political revolution, right? I want a spiritual revolution, I want people's eyes to be open to the fact that this is murder. This is life. These are babies. It's interesting, though, as we watch this whole thing unfold, immediately after, at least in Georgia, where they passed this, what I think they call it the fetal heartbeat bill, where, where as soon as a heartbeat is detected, it's like, that's like five or six weeks, it's like abortion is illegal. Which, again, I'm thankful for that. That is great. Lives will be saved. But right away, some of the entertainment industry uh, executives began to come out and be outspoken. Netflix, Disney, AT&T, which owns Warner Media, HBO, TNT, 
TBS and CNN, they all said, okay, we're pulling out of Georgia. We're not going to do any business in Georgia. Why? This argument comes down to just the simple thing. We want immorality. We want to be able to have sexual immorality. We want to be able to celebrate and to produce and to embrace pornea. And we don't want any consequences. I mean, that's the whole, that's the whole thing. It's, it's not really about women. It's about immorality. And that, as a culture, that's what we're divided over. These are things for the Christian we've got to wrestle with, we've got to put them away. He says in verse six and seven, look at verse six and seven. After listing out all those things, he says, and, and, and it's interesting that he says it about these things, these five things, and he doesn't say it about the others, although I think they all are, are kind of, they're all categorized as sin. He says, but it's because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience, in which, in them, you also once walked when you were living in them. I think Paul makes a very, very clear and very, very tough statement here. He says, listen, these sins, God's not happy. When he uses the word wrath, it's interesting in our text, the word wrath is used a couple of different ways. It's a couple of different Greek words that are used there. The idea here isn't just a flash of anger. Right? We think of that in terms of wrath, like I'm just mad right now. God's not mad right now. God's plotting. He's thinking. He's angry with a righteous anger, but it's constant. And it's building, and it's growing. And if you want to see wrath, just read the end of the book. Right? You just read the book of Revelation. When God's judgment is going to be poured out upon the world, that's wrath. He is not happy about these sins, or any sin, but in particular, he says it's because of these things that the wrath of God will come on the sons of disobedience. God will judge, and he alone can judge, right? It's not for you and I to judge. We can certainly say, well, this is what the word of God says, but we're not the judge, we're not the, the one who's gonna bring wrath, but he is, it's coming. I'm thankful, even as we consider the word wrath, that you and I, as Christians, we are not under wrath. Though we participate in these sins, let's be clear about that, no one is innocent. You participate in these sins. I participate in these sins to some degree. He says, you once walked in them, right? You once lived and were even controlled by some of these sins, like I, I could give you a list in my life, but I don't really want to do that this morning, right? We could, we could, we could tell stories. Uh, I did that one. He says, this is all supposed to be stuff that you formerly did, not that you're doing now. But I'm thankful as a Christian. God's word says he has not destined us for wrath. That, that right there ought to be the most freeing, wonderful thing you've ever heard in your life. God has not, you're, you deserve it. I deserve it. Just like everyone else, I deserve it. And yet, because of Jesus Christ, that's what he took at Calvary. He took the wrath that was due you and I. And so we're not gonna receive the wrath of God. Thank you, Lord. Amen? So he lists these five sins. They're great. They're grievous. They're an issue for God. Judgment is coming because of them. So what's a Christian to do? He begins, look at just the verse line there. He says, consider the members of your earthly body as dead. 
The King James language, I think, is a little bit different. It actually says, uh, put them to death. There's this idea that, that, that Paul is g- trying to, to, to give to us, I think, that it's like we've already declared, right, in the previous text, he's already declared, hey, hey, you're already dead in the sense that you've identified with Christ. He says, now, consider the members of your earthly body as dead. And so the idea there is to, to think, when you consider something, right, you're thinking, you're thinking about something, and then that thinking is actually going to take action. He says, consider or, or, or reckon yourself and your body, the members of your body, as dead. And so I would just say, think and act as if it were true. Problem is, we don't. We don't think and act oftentimes. You know, that there's that line, uh, when someone's kind of at the end of a relationship, they, they can say, you're dead to me. Hopefully that's not a real common line that you use with anybody, but, but, but you've heard it said maybe in jest or whatever, but it's like, you could say, you're dead to me. I'm done with you. That's what we need. That's the point that he's making, is you need to say that to your flesh. You are dead to me. I'm done with you. I'm done with these things. Those things all belong in the past. I love the way Paul puts it in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. He says, and again, this is the way he's thinking. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. This is by identification. He says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Notice that this whole idea is it's, it's, it's an identification with Christ, but it's by faith. By faith, I declare what Jesus did at Calvary 2,000 years ago. I identify with, he did it for me. I receive that. I receive the results of that. I'm considering myself dead because I died with him. He says in Romans chapter 6, knowing this. Same kind of thing. He says that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. And so on one hand, this is something that we do by faith. We just believe it. Right? We we just believe it. Because God's word says it. He's declared it, so we embrace it. But then we also have to, in an intellectual way, we have to intellectually embrace it. We have to think. We have to actually talk to ourselves like this. I'm dead to those things. I'm no longer going to do those things. Because by faith, I've been crucified with Christ. And, and, and then I love at the end of uh, verse 7 there of Romans 6 where he says, He who has died is free. From sin. I think the idea there is obviously the you're free from the obligation of sin, the, the condemnation that comes with sin, but also to the obligation to fulfill the sin. Sometimes it doesn't seem like that, but it's true. You are set free from the physical obligation to follow through with these sins. <coughs> Jesus has provided, in fact, he is the way of escape. It's not just an intellectual belief in what he did 2,000 years ago, but it's believing in the results of that in our lives today. These are great memory verses, I'm telling you. Galatians 2.20 in particular has spoken to me for so many years. I've been crucified with Christ I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer me. I'm not alive. It's him. I need him to live in me. God set me free. And this is how he does it. Now, he says here, as as Paul continues here, he says, um, you also put them all aside. He, he goes on from these lists. 
He gives us another list, but that's where we get the idea where he says, okay, first he's given us this idea of consider, reckon, think, again, by faith. We're, we're intellectually, we're just believing that. We're hanging on to that. But then he says, Put them all aside. And, and he, it, it says also, now he's going to give us this other list of these sins, but he says also, so he's linking the first ones with the second group, and he says all of them belong in the same category of clothing to get rid of. Right? So take it to goodwill. Get rid of it. Burn it. Whatever you need to do. These clothes are stinky. These things don't work anymore. They're part of your former manner of life. They don't belong in the new life. Put them off. Put them all aside. Take them off. Get rid of them. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech. These are different. They're still sin. They're still just as, you know... Bad in the sense that they're all condemned. These are particularly, though, sins that we commit against others. And I would say uh, you, can, you can sin in, these, in this way with the people you love. These, are, these can be family sins. It's not just people out there, right? Sometimes it's like, oh, they're our enemies, but this is our family. It's like, no, we're pretty indiscriminate. These are sins that are against people and they primarily come out in what we say and how we say it. I had a great illustration that came up this week. I, I, I hate it when the Lord just kind of gives me this wonderful illustration, but it always makes me look bad and make my wife look good. So here we go. I, I told her I was going to tell you this and she's like, oh, that'll be good. <laughs> So we're remodeling our kitchen, and we're, I'm just doing all these things, and, you know, I'm just Joe Homeowner. I'm not a super skilled guy, so it's all, you know, my manhood is at stake with every bit of the project, and it's, sometimes it's frustrating. And anyway, um, I forget what I was doing this week. I think um, I might have been doing, you know, after, while you're doing these kinds of chores, you've got regular chores to keep up with. As well, and I think I was just doing you know, yard work and cleaning up the yard. It's you know in the Northwest, you gotta you gotta get it. Well, and it's not raining because you never know what's gonna happen next week. So I'm trying to get the yard cleaned up and getting it back in shape. And since we've been remodeling, I got this big pile of scrap out in the front, and it's just kind of building. And I'm gonna take it to the dump. And so I'm working and just trying to make things look good. And and, and my wife, I don't know what she's doing. You know, it's like, what are you doing in there? I'm, I'm cleaning up. I'm doing this. And she comes out with this old lounge chair, you know, one of those folding lounge chairs that you can lie down on. It's like, this thing's old, old. Look, this canvas thing, it's just gross. And, and she, she goes out and she takes it out by the side of the road, by the garbage cans there, and she puts a big free sign on it. I hate that. <laughs> I mean, can we, I, I mean, this is like a therapy session. I hate that. I mean, I'm just here in Sanford and Son. Okay, there's a bad cultural reference. After last week, I've just apologized for all my cultural re uh, re references. But it's like, I don't want to look like a junkyard. I don't want to have junk out in the front. It's like, and I'm, I'm like, I'm watching her do it. And I'm just like, ah. Oh. I'm trying to, I, I want our yard to at least look nice when people drive by. And it's like, ah, oh. ah. Oh. And I got mad. I mean, I was, I was mad. And, and I'm battling, right? I, I, I'm battling. You guys know what it's like. I'm, kind of, I'm just mad at her. It's like she knows I ate that. <laughs> and she does it anyway. She doesn't care what I think. I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the head. You know, she's supposed to honor me. She's not honoring me. And I'm just, I'm mad. And so I thought, well, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna throw it in the junk pile. And I thought, no, dude, that's like a, that's like a three day fight. Let's not do that. Let's not go. There. It's like, it's like, I'm just gonna talk to her about it. Mm, that's still the rest of the day is shot. Just shut up. Just shut up. Right? Just, but I'm, but I'm just angry and I'm trying to figure out. It's like, Lord. 
I don't want to be mad at my wife. But I was, I was mad, and I was, I was hanging on to it and trying to figure out what to do. But thank God, I just kept my mouth shut. And, you know, that just helped me to get more work done because I had adrenaline. <laughs> so I'm watching this whole thing, and the sign blew off, and I was like, yeah, the sign blew off, yeah. <laughs> and like five minutes later, some guy pulls up, I mean, almost a screeching stop. And he jumps out of his truck. And you could just tell the guy's delighted. And, and, and he looks at the thing. He checks it all out. And he's just like, yippee, skippy. And he grabs it, takes the sign and the whole thing and drives off. And I'm just like, no, 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 no. I was like so, I was even madder than it was like, ah, she won. <laughs> I knew, I knew, it was, I, was, I was looking at this whole idea of anger, and I'm like, oh, Lord, that's one of my big problems. I get angry. And yet, the Lord just, it's like, I kept my mouth shut. I didn't, I didn't enter into a fight. It wasn't really necessary to do anyway. And she just has this thing. Like, for her, that's her whole life. To her, she knows that guy's adrenaline rush. And just He had an endorphin hit right there because he found something for free. God bless him. And now our house is known as the place to come to look for junky stuff. <laughs> anyway, I just give you that as just an example. These are things, these are things you've got to wrestle with. It's real, isn't it? I mean, you have the same issues. You get mad about stuff. What are you going to do with it? It's real. It's part of life. Over and over, the older I get, the more the Lord shows me, that thing you're mad about, I don't care. You know, you got to let it go. The idea of wrath, again, is in this context, the word is actually different than the previous one. This is that passionate anger that just flares up. Do you guys have that come up sometimes? Where it's not like this kind of like, oh, I'm really mad about that. It's like, I'm mad right now. I'm going to throw something. <laughs> it's like, put it aside. That's got to be dealt with. Malice. Malice. This is, this is I want to hurt you. Now I feel this for the dog. <laughs> oh, rest, rest in peace, Rudy. <laughs> no, I mean, malice is when you just, you want to hurt somebody. That's wrong. Slander. Slander is when you speak evil. You say something unkind or untrue, always usually behind somebody's back. Sometimes it's to their face, but you can, you, know, you can do either one. Abusive speech. It's foul speaking. It's low, obscene speech. Comes out of your mouth. James talks about this, right? The things that come out of our mouth. It's the thing that you're thinking in your heart. And I would just say this. In our day, we have to be as concerned with what we type as as much as what we say. Because somehow, behind a keyboard, we can just, we feel like we can get rid of, we, we can say all kinds of things. That's the same sin. It's abusive. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 5. Jesus spoke pretty clearly about this. Matthew 5, here in the Sermon on the Mount, he's, he's really clearly, some of what he's saying is directed towards the, the scribes and the Pharisees, but he says, you've heard that the ancients were told, verse 21 here, Matthew 5, you've heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder. Right? This is one of the Ten Commandments, something they would know. And then Jesus speaks with absolute authority, which is something that really ticked these guys off, because it's like, who, how dare you? But he says, uh, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But he says, verse 22, but I say that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, 
shall be guilty before the Supreme Court, and whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Thank you, Jesus. He says, listen, the origin of wanting to kill somebody, it's the same sin. And, and, and whether it's abusive speech or slander or malice, anger, whatever, it's like it's the same thing. He says that, that thing, it's the same thing and you're guilty of it. Don't think, oh, I didn't kill him. I didn't kill him, so I'm okay. It's like, no, you wanted to kill him. Or, or you said things. And, and he says, I mean, this is hard to digest, but he says, if you say to somebody, you good for nothing, I think the idea there is not like, like in the sense of kind of a lighthearted thing. This is when you consider somebody as worthless. When you say, you know what, you're worthless. You know, there's a difference. When you, when you actually have an attitude towards somebody that they're worthless, that they're good for nothing, you just eliminated God's grace. You've spoken against the very grace that you've received that should be ruling your life. I think we have to be really careful about that in the sense of writing people off. You good for nothing or you fool. Are people fools sometimes? Yes, absolutely. But it's this kind of evil, kind of judgmental, unwarranted thing that comes out of our mouth. Jesus says, yeah, be careful of that. It's an unwarranted anger that ends up coming out in our lives through our mouths. Now, I would just say on balance, anger itself is not evil. Anger is a human emotion. You would never say sadness was evil. You would never say gladness is evil. They're human emotions. They're part and parcel of living life. You get angry about stuff. That's not necessarily evil, but it can become evil if you hang on to it. He says in Ephesians 4, Paul says, be angry and yet do not sin. I think there's a, there's a cause for righteous anger. There is a cause to be angry at times. But it's dangerous. It can be dangerous. He says, and so he says, don't sin. He says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Why? Because you could be giving the devil an opportunity. And of course, this applies so much in marriage. Because you get angry with one another. And sometimes you get angry for a righteous reason. Like on some level, I suppose, if I dialogued with my wife about this whole thing with the lawn chair, she should honor me and not put junk out in front of the house. I mean, I think that's okay. I should love her and tolerate it, I suppose. But if it were going to come to a fight, if we were going to be angry with one another and cross... Don't end the day, right? Get, take care of it, which means repent, which means I got to apologize for my evil feelings and she gotta, has to apologize for whatever things she's done. <laughs> it's usually just me. <laughs> James says this way, he says, everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Oh God, help me with that. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Put it off, Paul would say. Put it off, it stinks. It's filthy clothing. Put it off. Don't, don't put it on. Don't wear it. Don't hang on to it. And I would just say this, just practically, you've got to re regularly wrestle with these things. You have to consider it dead. When it comes up, you have to say, that's part of the old nature. That's part of the sin nature. Got, get, got to get rid of it. He goes on and he says, do not lie to one another. I, every time I, I come across the idea of lying, I hear my father as a little boy, I just remember he, hearing him say with absolute just passion, I hate liars. <laughs> you just say that. <laughs> you know, with some people, you know how to tell whether or not they're lying if their lips are moving. <laughs> Don't be liars. Speak the truth. The Bible tells us to speak the truth in love. All these behaviors, all these sins, they, they belong to the old nature, not the new nature. You have a choice in the matter. 
It's like the clothes you choose to put on. It doesn't always seem like it, right? It, it seems like, man, it, it just kind of comes up. It's, it's in my flesh. Paul talks all about this in Romans chapter 7, where he, he talks about the, 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 the wrestling match that he has. He says, the thing that I want to do, I don't do, and the thing that I don't want to do, I do. We get it, right? You get it. It's not like any of this is easy, it's not easy. You are a saved person, person living in a decaying body of flesh that wants to do things. And, but you've got to be engaged in, in the whole thing. He, he says this at the conclusion of this discussion that he has in Romans 7. And by the way, that's just a homework assignment. You can go read that, verses 14 through 25. He says, uh, after talking about this wrestling that he has, he says in verse 24, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever feel like, ah, oh, when will I be set free from this? He follows it with the answer in verse 25. He says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God. On the other, my flesh, the law of sin. It's like there's this division. But he says, with my mind, I'm serving the law of God. That's where, that's where he says here in Colossians, consider it dead. It's a battle that goes on in your mind, in your heart. You've got to decide what you're going to wear. Now, he tells us repeatedly to put on these good things. Look at verse 10. This is his fashion advice. He says, put on the new self. Put on the new self. Is that my timer? Am I out of time already? Is that? <laughs> I am out of time. He says, put on the new self, verse 10. In Romans 13, he says it this way. He says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the, the flesh in regard to its lust. I, I, I love that verse in Romans 13 because I think this really speaks to what our issue is. We think, oh, oh, my flesh really needs this. And so we make provision for the flesh. We, we plan to provide for the flesh. So much of our lives, we're thinking about it. It gets towards the end of church service and you're already thinking about lunch because you're hungry. That's your flesh just crying out, feed me, feed me, feed me. Well, it does this in all the sinful ways as well. Oh, I just need a little, I need a little entertainment. I need a little release. No, you don't. You need Jesus. And we have to, we have to rearrange our thinking because we're constantly, no one has to coach you in oh, self-care. Oh, you really need to take care of yourself. You just need a break. No, you need Jesus. Your flesh will take care of itself. It does. Don't make provision for your fleshly indulgence. He says, put on the new self. In Romans, he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 13, he says, put on a heart of compassion. And then he lists off these kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, and forgiving each other. I, I had to do that in a sense, like with this whole thing with my wife when I was angry with her. I'm angry. I got to put that off. I got to keep my mouth shut. I gotta, okay, I love my wife. I love my wife. Keep your mouth shut, Jim. Be a good boy. Got to do that. You have to make a decision. Put on love. Put on love. This is nice looking. Right? You want to wear clothes that look good. Love always looks good. Love's always becoming. We have to decide to love. In a sense, all of these things are just the fruit of the Spirit. As Christians, we have to decide whether or not we're going to embrace and live and operate in the fruit of the Spirit or in the fruit or the, the deeds of the flesh. In Galatians 5, he says, walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit means live under the control of the Holy Spirit. Is this easy? No, I think it's a discipline that we work out our whole lives. It's already begun. 
and that you are a Christian, you are a new person, you have a new self. Now it's a matter of just following the things that the Lord would have you do. In Galatians 5, 22 through 24, of course, there's the whole list of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's what I want in my life. I hope that's what you want in your life. Those things, they're naturally occurring in the sense of this is what the Lord wants to do and will do in your life, but you have to decide, right? You still have to partner with him because you can fight all of those things as you feed the flesh, as you clothe yourself with the things of the flesh. How do you practically do it? Real quickly, I gotta go through these five things real quickly. I'll try to get you out of here on time. It's not going to happen. He says, uh, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Number one, you've got to have the peace of Christ. If you're not a Christian, you do not have the peace of Christ. You might have some, some, some religion, some idea of Christ, but in order to actually have the peace of Christ, in order to let Christ rule in your hearts, you've got to, you've got to belong to him. And so if you've never had a relationship with Christ, you've got to enter into that relationship by faith, by trusting him, by repenting of your sins, by getting rid of the old man and being born again. Then and only then will you have the indwelling, right? And when the Lord comes to live inside of you, at that point you have this, 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 this help Right? The Holy Spirit is a helper, and you can actually just kind of like cooperate with him. But you must be born again in order to have the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, but it's also a decision that you make every day. You have, number two, you have a conscious daily choice. And I would say over and over throughout the day, you have many, many choices to make. To put on the new self. You have to do this every day, every morning. You have a routine, right? Everyone has a morning routine. You have a ritual, you have a religion that you go through every morning. I don't know what yours is, I just know what mine is. And part of mine is a struggle every day to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not successful every day, but a lot of days I am, and I'm so thankful for those days. And you say, well, I'm really busy, I have to get up super early. Great, get up earlier. Go to bed earlier. You have to decide whether or not you want to do this. It doesn't happen by accident. You won't just fall into it. You have to decide. You put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he says, put on love. He says, this is the perfect bond. In, in chapter 2, verse 2, he says, you're knit together in love. This is the perfect thing. If there is one thing that you want to put on, it's Jesus. It's his love. It's, ah, I want this. Number three, be the church of Jesus Christ. He says in verse 15, you were called in one body. Why does he put that in there? He says, he goes on, he says, there's no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free man, but Christ is all in all, uh, is, is in all and, or is all and in all. He says, what, what is this all about? He says, you're part of the body of Christ. Remember that, don't forget it. Because within the body, this helps to dissolve all the little petty differences that we have. Even in the marriage relationship. It's my, my wife belongs to Jesus. He loves her the same as he loves me. This dissolves, this kind of love, it dissolves problems. He says in verse 12, as those who have been chosen of God, that's me, that's you, we're together. This is why we gather together as well, to take in these things and to celebrate the common love of God that we have. He says, forgive one another, or verse 13, bear with one another, forgiving one another, just as the Lord forgave you, so also you should forgive others. Number four, and this, I could, I could preach on this for an hour. He says, be thankful. Be thankful. Count your blessings, not your trials. Do you have trials? You do. 
You've got trials. Every one of us has trials. And we sometimes, it's like we focus on them. We make a list of them. It's like, oh, if I could just tell you all the aches and pains that I have and the things that are falling apart. Even in your worst situation, you can count blessings. Are you breathing? Thank the Lord. Are you dying? Thank the Lord. You're going to be with him soon. Seriously, there's things to be thankful for. Is your car out of gas? Be thankful that you have a car. Many people don't. I mean, seriously, like in everything, you can, you can find a way to be thankful. There is no topic in the scripture that is covered more than being thankful. Do you know that? Take a look. In these three verses, 15, 16, 17, Paul mentions it three times. Be thankful. With thankfulness in your heart to God, giving thanks to, uh, through him to God the Father. Be thankful. This is the number one problem in our world today. People are not thankful. I just made a pretty, that's a pretty bold statement. It's the number one problem in our world today. People are not thankful. Look at what Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. You want to know what drives the insanity of our world? It's this very one thing. We are not thankful. We have not, we've decided we're not going to honor God anymore. We're not going to be thankful to him. And so we've gone crazy. As Christians, man, we should be thankful every day. And thankfulness begins in our heart. It expresses itself in our prayers, in our talking, in our walking, in our giving. Thankfulness is worship. This is the very core of worship. When you worship, you're thanking God. You're recognizing who he is, who you are, who he is in proper relationship. Train yourself. Learn to be thankful people. Number five, he says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. He, there's this long list with wisdom and teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. <coughs> Yesterday I was mowing the lawn and, you know, just doing all the different things with the lawn. I was probably out there for three hours. I listened to three hours of Bible study. I thank God for what Apple invented. Seriously. It's like I just dialed up some Chuck Smith, and it's like, man, I'm just like, you have access to so, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You can listen to so many things that are wonderful, podcasts and MP3s. Like no time in the world, we can just saturate. And he says, richly, abundantly, let the word of Christ richly or abundantly dwell in you. Here's one warning that I will give with the things that you listen to. He says, let the word of Christ, the word of Christ dwell, richly dwell within you. Because within the category of all those things, modern day psalms or modern day hymns or spiritual songs, you can find all kinds of ideas that are not the word of Christ. So be careful. Especially with some of the books that are out there. And finally, communion. We're going to have communion this morning. And this is just another great way to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. In communion, we have these, uh, everything is included in this one act. We do it as a family. Uh, we're taking off the flesh. Like in communion, the communion, we're doing this table thing, so we're no longer going to serve you, although if you need to be served, just put your hand up and, and someone will bring you the juice and the crackers if you, if you need help with that. But the whole idea is we're, we're, we're saying, I need this. We're confessing our sin, which is taking off. We're taking it off. I don't want it. We're putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. We're recognizing our need. Jesus, I need you. I need what you did at Calvary. Thank you for that. We're appropriating his peace because we're reconciled with God, we're reminding ourselves that because of what Jesus Christ did, we have peace, we can have peace. Oh, thank you, Lord. We're making a decision to follow him, so we're actually actively involved. We're saying, yes, I want that. We're being the church. 
from the beginning of time. This is what the church has done. They've gathered together. When they gather together, they remember the Lord Jesus. It's important for us to do. We're being thankful. We're thankful for, in the juice and in the cracker, his provision of salvation. We recognize his body that was broken for us. We recognize his blood that was shed for the forgiveness of sins, his provision. And so we're saying, thank, thank you, Lord. We're recognizing his life, death, and resurrection in the Holy Spirit that fills us. And we're embracing his word that tells us all these things. Let's have the band come up. Father, thank you for your word to us. We thank you, God, that we get to celebrate your goodness this morning. We want to put you on. Lord, we want, to, we want to take off. We want to cast away from us all these evil deeds, all this sin. We want to embrace you. And we pray, Lord, that you would fill us with your spirit. Even as we receive the communion this morning, Lord, we, we just remember what you did. And we're so thankful, Lord, that you came to set us free, that we could... We could follow you. We can do these things. We choose, Lord, to follow you. We pray these things in Jesus' name.